Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Karen Jackson Weaver, and I'm the Associate Vice President of Global Faculty Engagement and Innovation Advancement here at NYU. And it is my honor, pleasure, and privilege to welcome each of you to the NYU Trailblazer Ceremony, sponsored by the offices of the President, Provost, and the Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity, and Strategic Innovation. This is a very special gathering, and I am so pleased and delighted that each of you took out time to be here with us this evening. We have a very special program in store for you, and we are extremely thrilled to be presenting Dr. Janetta Cole with the NYU Trailblazer Award. Before we get started with this evening's festivities, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the leader of the Office of Global Inclusion, none other than our very own Dr. Lisa Coleman. And I just want to say a few words before Dr. Coleman comes and leads us in our program. She is NYU's inaugural Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion, Diversity, and Strategic Innovation and the university's chief diversity officer. Dr. Coleman reports to NYU's president, Dr. Andrew Hamilton, and she works, yes, you can clap for Dr. Hamilton. <laughs> and they work to lead and coalesce around the office of the provost, the deans and other senior leaders, internal stakeholders, external partners, and constituents to advance, promote, and build capacity for strategic global inclusion, diversity, equity, belonging, and innovation initiatives across NYU's global network. Prior to joining the NYU community, Dr. Coleman served as Harvard University's first special assistant to the president and its first chief diversity officer. During her tenure there, she and her team developed some of the first initiatives in the country focused on the intersections of technology and disability. Prior to her tenure at Harvard, she directed the Africana program at Tufts University and was later appointed as that institution's first senior executive on issues of diversity and inclusion reporting to the Office of the President. Dr. Coleman is an NYU alum. She earned her doctorate in social and cultural analysis and American studies and three master's degrees from The Ohio State University in African and African American studies. Women, women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Communication Studies. Her undergraduate foci included sociology, anthropology, and computer science. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Coleman. Oh, no, it's okay. Oh. Good evening. So before we get started, can everyone just silence your phone? Yep, please. Now let's take a moment of silence to honor those who have gone before us, those whose land upon which we stand, those who made it possible for us to be here. Thank you. Thank you to those who work behind the scenes, all of those people who do the invisible labor, the caterers, the people who are all at the back of the room, the public safety, all of those people. Can we give them a round of applause? So I'm Lisa Coleman, as you, as you heard. Uh, my pronouns are she and hers, and it's an absolute pleasure to be with you this evening. Thank you to everyone who was involved in planning tonight's event. Thank you, Karen, for the introduction, and in particular, thank you to the NYU 100 Steering Committee members. Your dedication and passion have been extraordinary over these last few months, and thank you for the meetings, the discussions, and the great events that will be happening all year. Thank you to our ASL interpreters who are sitting right in the front. Thank you to all the volunteers and to the hardworking global inclusion team. It's my honor to work with you every day and thank you for all that you do. 
because without you, nothing is possible, even me like getting on stage sometimes, so thank you. Uh, thanks, you, thanks for joining us in celebrating the launch of the NYU Women 100 Women with an X initiative. I know that we had a cancellation last evening and the Amor was ill and could not join us, but we will re be rescheduling that program, but we are thrilled to have Dr. Cole with us here this evening. I want to give a special thanks to members of our global campuses who will be vo uh, joining us via live stream. This is being live streamed for our other campuses. I'm so thankful to all the people who've come together to put together the NYU 100 programs. And thank you to the audience who are currently here and thank you for building capacity. The NYU 100 is building on local and national centennial commemorations and highlights the intersectional, historical, contemporary, and shifting notions of gender, woman, and womanhood. All of the programming seeks to acknowledge the complicated and various histories of women and the relevant cultural, artistic, and scientific endeavors that have continued to advance representation and equity for women across race, creed, religion, sex, country of origin, ability, sexual identity, gender identity, and orientation, socioeconomic, political, and economic statuses. 2020 marks 100 years since the ratification of the 19th Amendment, but as we know, not all women gained the right to vote at that time. So the NYU programs also seek to recognize the unseen and acknowledge efforts of women who have been historically overlooked. During the course of this year, we will honor many, many, many women across transgender, non-binary, and cisgender experiences. At NYU, we have a history of pathbreaking for women, and this legacy is being carried on by our faculty, students, and staff today. NYU has uh, uh, graduates and alums across a wide range of professions. At NYU, well over half of the university's senior leadership team are women, of which I'm a part. Catherine Fleming is our chief academic officer, our first female provost. The Tandon School of Engineering 2023 graduating class is comprised of 46% women. For those of you who don't know that, that's roughly double the average for U.S. engineering schools. And I know that uh, our president might mention this, but uh, we, have a new de we have a dean who came in at the same time I did, uh, Yelena Kovinik, and she's the first woman to lead the school since its founding in 1854. <laughs> and then we appointed Mariette Westerman in Abu Dhabi as the first woman vice chancellor. NYU 100 allows us to celebrate the women, including our students and alums who have dedicated their excellence, brilliance, genius, and work to making their societies and world stronger. Our president, Andrew Hamilton, has often commented on NYU's history of student organizing and activism. He has said that inclusion, diversity, equity, and belonging are, quote, not only important to cherish for their own sake, but they are also vital for advancing knowledge, sparking innovation, and creating sustainable communities, end quote. At NYU, we teach and experiment with new forms of science, artistry, learning, technology, and research to help our students develop the skills to be and remain innovative and to navigate conflicts as they emerge, both in the present and in the future. As we move into this collaborative revolution, for those of you who follow sort of the revolutions, right, the industrial revolution, the technology revolution, and those of you know we're in the collaborative revolution, and for those of you who know we're in the collaborative revolution, you know that women are central to collaboration. So our new normal will be collaboration, and women, of course, are dominating higher education. Every field, every area, and we're seeing it, even in STEM, we're seeing some, some moves, and certainly in our own school, our own engineering school, and our business school, we're seeing some changes there as well. We are pleased today that NYU communities are more diverse than ever in history of the university and the smartest, according to MJ Noel Finn. In fact, <laughs> um, uh, I think I couldn't get in today. I think that's what she tells me. So here we are at NYU, or maybe that's Andy who tells me that. Um, so here we are at NYU to take this year to revisit our past as we interview, innovate for our collective futures. We're gonna recognize that innovation has emerged from the conflicting and varying voices of women speaking and living their truths to bring new paths of thinking and doing and we want to elevate these innovations. The fight for gender equity is certainly not contained within the past 100 years, nor by the experiences of people in the US. 
the global legacies of women innovating for justice and gender equality are rich and still in full motion. We have new groups and all types of new programs here at NYU, and we hope that you will visit our website for a listing of all the amazing events, forthcoming programs, and the new and older NYU, across NYU that elevate uh, all women and girls. Now, some of you have heard me speak in the past about my own life. I, as you may have noticed, am a woman. I mentioned it earlier. I also told you my pronouns. So last week, I had to give a presentation on generations, diversity, and the future of work. Because I, you know, I'm a diversity officer, so they ask you to speak about generations a lot. Because people in the corporate world are kind of asking what's going on with these generations, and then they ask me to explain it to them. But as I was preparing for that presentation, I called my mother. My mother is 87 years old. And so I sent my mother the slide deck, because you know, that's what you do. You send your mother the slide deck, trying to impress her. And so my mother looks at the slide deck, and the first slide has a listing of all the generations. And her generation is coded the silent generation. <laughs> my mother, I'm not silent. What is this? What, are you presenting this? You tell those people I am not silent. I have never been silent. I do not want to be silent. I am not silent. I am 87 years old and I have a lot to say. <laughs> she goes on to say that neither was her mother or her mother's mother. They were never silent and they all lived until their 90s. So I will say this that as I do the generation's presentations, I have recoded that generation to the non-silent. <laughs> My mother is a woman who went back to school to become a computer scientist in the late 70s and 80s, and she would become the first in many, many things that she would do. But I think what she did for me and what she did was she created what I call as a posse, and some of you have heard me talk about this before, but she created a posse of women who surrounded me and my brother, and they raised us in many ways. And I say that my father, who a really lovely person, and I think the thing that he taught me the best was to respect myself and that I should not accept anyone who did not respect me as a woman because he respected my mother as such. So I am thankful I am thankful for my parents who would enroll me in single sex schools for the first part of my life, where then I would think I would be, my mother would ask me to go to Spelman and I would say no because I want co-ed. <laughs> then I would kick myself. Uh, so I'm a Spelman wannabe. But I am very thankful for my beginnings. I'm thankful that I came to NYU and was able to do my dissertation and my work here. And I'm thankful to have been, to be able to come back to New York to work with an array of such talented and diverse people doing such extraordinary work, and that I'm in some way able to contribute to advancing the concerns, the rights, the voices of young people, middle, old, and not silent women as well. There were no SVP CDOs 20, 25 years ago. There was no me. And I'm thankful to all the women who laid the path to create these types of new roles, who innovated and broke new ground and ceilings. I'm thankful for all the histories and struggles of so many women before me at NYU, like Patricia Carey. <laughs> like Evelyn Timba, Frances White, Trisha Rose, Paula Marshall, and so many more. I am also thankful that I get to meet and amplify the voices of people like our speaker with us tonight, who have blazed the way for so very many. When you're in the presence of Dr. Cole, random people walk up and are like, Dr. Cole, Dr. Cole, you changed my life, and she changed mine through her leadership, through her practice, and through her willingness to step up and be present for so many of us throughout all of these years, these eight decades. I must confess, I had a wonderful time, as I've mentioned, as an undergrad, but when I look back at my time, I'm both a Spelman and Delta want to be. We didn't have those sororities at my campus, and I still contribute to that school that my mother tried to get me to attend. So it's my great honor to be here with you all tonight, and before we turn to the award presentation, let me ask our president, Andy Hamilton, to provide some remarks. Thank you. Lisa, is by any chance your mother looking for a job? <laughs> I, I, th I think I might have a role for her at NYU. Let, let, me, let me, ladies and gentlemen, 
thank all of you for being here tonight. Thank you, Lisa. And let me also thank the Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity Strate and Strategic Innovation for all of the work that they have done, that they have put into the planning of the NYU Women 100, along with the steering committee, along with the numerous schools and divisions throughout the university. But before I say my words, uh, that I want to tonight. I thought that in, co in, in concert with all of the emails that I've been sending today, I thought I might spend the first 30 minutes of my three-hour lecture this evening giving you a technical demonstration on hand washing. And so as, as we all tackle the challenges we have ahead of us, I often think a night like tonight the celebration of a wonderful contributor to society, to our world, it reminds us of what matters. It reminds us why being at a university like NYU is a great privilege, but also why it helps us see perspective in all the right ways. And, and NYU is nearly 200 years old. I was at the University of Oxford before NYU. Oxford's nearly 900 years old. And while we face a crisis like the coronavirus, which is an immediate crisis, we have 200 years of history. Oxford has 900 years of history to help us not only put this crisis in perspective, but also to recognize the important things that have happened at this university in wider society but also we can now look forward another 200 years because we know NYU is gonna be here 200 years from now, Oxford will be here 900 years from now, and we can think about all of the things that still need to be done, that still need to change and be achieved. And in this special year, 2020, this year of legislation that marked a tremendous step forward, we all know that it was an incomplete step forward. NYU Women 100 gives us an opportunity to reflect on what has been achieved in the fight for gender rights and equality, but it also allows us to reflect on what hasn't been achieved and what is still to be achieved in the future, this fight that is still very much evolving, as indeed is our understanding of gender itself. And NYU has its own complex history in this regard. We often love to tout the fact that NYU went against the custom of the time and, 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 and was designed to be an institution that would educate people from all economic backgrounds, not just the elite who were up at Columbia and, and Yale and Harvard, but while that was an important step, and NYU did take important steps to broaden access to education. NYU's doors were still in those early years closed to women and closed to people of color. And they remain closed for many decades. And it's important that we recognize that as part of our history. But NYU was ahead of the curve in some ways. Our school of law, admitted women in 1890 and was one of the earliest law schools in the entire nation to do so. And I can't help but note that that 1890 date was 60 years before Lisa's former employer, Harvard, admitted women into its law school. In fact, by the time the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920, NYU School of Law had already more than 300 women graduates. NYU School of Pedagogy, the precursor to what we now call Steinhardt School of Education, uh, Culture and Human Development, our School of Pedagogy admitted women to its very first class in 1890. And so indeed did the precursor of the Stern School of Business when it was founded in 1900. And I have to say it, 63 years before the Harvard Business School admitted women. So, and there's no doubt 
that once NYU began admitting women, they became an influential force on campus. As we've heard from Lisa, they very much still are. Two women received undergraduate degrees from NYU in 1915. Today's NYU undergraduate class is 57% female. And we know, however, that there is still much more to be done. There are more areas we need to make progress, including attracting more women to STEM subjects, improving the percentage of tenured faculty who are female, and continuing to focus on improving the experience of women from marginalized backgrounds. It was wonderful to hear Lisa talk about the recent leadership changes that we've had, uh, Katie Fleming, provost, the, our deputy provost, the wonderful Sibel Raver, uh, a woman, uh, our new dean of, of, of engineering. And I have to say, I am looking forward someday, hopefully not for a while, but someday to meeting the first female president of NYU. And that, let's hope, will happen before too long. In the meantime, it is so critical for all of us that we look to inspiring trailblazers, role models from within and outside the NYU community, like tonight's honoree, Janetta Betch Cole. Dr. Cole, as you've heard and will hear more, is deeply respected in higher education and far beyond. And we're delighted that she's here tonight to receive this honor you honor us, Dr. Cole, by allowing us to honor you and to share with us her insight in this wonderful week of celebration, but also this recognition of all that still needs to be done. Thank you all. Hello. Thank you, Andy very much for your remarks and uh, for reminding us about the six years. Um, so, so now is my time to talk a little bit about Dr. Cole, and I do this with great humility. Tonight we honor Dr. Janetta B. Cole with the NYU Trailblazer Award for innovative and path-breaking work. The Trailblazer Award recognizes and celebrates and honors individuals who have contributed significantly to their fields, created new opportunities and pathways for themselves and others. Dr. Cole recognizes the relationship between diversity, innovation, education, and service. She has remarked, quote, an education that teaches you to understand something about the world has only done half of the assignment. The other half is to teach you to do something about making the world a better place, end quote. Jeanette B. Cole, born 1936, is an American anthropologist, educator, museum director, and former college president. She was the first female president of Spelman College and HBCU. She was also the president of Bennett College. She was also the director of the Smithsonian Smithsonian's Institution's National Museum of African Art. She was born in Jacksonville, Florida. She is the granddaughter, great granddaughter, of Abraham Lincoln Lewis, Florida's first black millionaire, entrepreneur, and co founder of the Afro American Industrial and Benefit Association, and his wife, Mary Kings, Kingsley Samus. Cole enrolled in college at the age of 15 at Fisk University. She transferred to Oberlin, which we were talking about earlier in Ohio, where she completed a Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology. She then attended graduate school at Northwestern University, earning a Master's of Arts and her Doctorate of Philosophy degrees in anthropology. And she did her dissertation in field research in Liberia. Cole served as the professor at Washington State University from 1962 to 1970, where she co-founded one of the US's first black studies programs. And I must confess, that was one of the very first programs that tried to hire me. In 1970, Cole began working in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. While at Amherst, she played a pivoted role in developing the university's W.E.B. Du Bois Department of African American Studies. 
She then later moved to Hunter College and became the director of the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Program. From 1998 to 2001, Cole was a professor of anthropology, women's studies, and African American studies at Emory University in Atlanta. Dr. Cole highlights during her administration cannot be underestimated. During her time at Spelman, she shepherded the campus through a $113 million campaign, attracted the significantly higher enrollments as students increased, and overall the ranking of the school became one of the best liberal arts schools in the country. In 1992, the college announced the receipt of a $37 million grant from DeWitt Wallace Reader's Digest Fund, the largest gift ever given to a historically black college. She established numerous programs while at Spelman, including the Spelman College Mentorship Program, the International Affairs Center, and the Office of Community Service. Spelman's rankings, as I've already mentioned, soared and being named the number one regional liberal arts college in 1992. And in 1994, the Association of, Amer of Medical Colleges ranked Spelman number five among undergraduate programs for black students accepted to medical school. And for those of you who know, you know I worked for the Association of American Medical Colleges. And so to be ranked in that ranking is very, uh, very important in terms of the medical fields. And in 1989, the Living and Learning Center II was erected and dedicated, uh, to, dedicated as the Janetta B. Cole Living and Learning Center in honor of her 70th birthday. After a decade of, decade of service to Spelman, Dr. Cole remained in Atlanta and she returned to the classroom and teaching at Emory as the Presidential Distinguished Professor of Anthropology, Women's Studies, and African American Studies. And then she became the president of Bennett College, as I've mentioned earlier. There she led another successful campaign. In addition, she founded an art gallery to contribute to the college's culture. And then she so-called retired. <laughs> but then she continued to serve as the chair of the Janetta B. Cole Global Diversity and Inclusion Institute in Atlanta. And then two years after that, after her retirement, she was named the director of the Smithsonian's <laughs> National <laughs> Museum of African Art. I look forward to my retirement. Dr. Cole has served on many boards, including the Rockefeller Foundation, Home Depot, Merck, United Way, and on the Advisory Council of the National Center for Science Education. During her Spelman presidency, she was the first woman elected to serve on the board of Coca-Cola Enterprises. She has also chaired the board of the National Visionary Leadership Project and served on the Advisory Committee of America's Promise and the Points of Light Foundation. She is the recipient of more than 50 honorary degrees and more accolades than I can go through here. I'm just going to name a few, although I've already named some. In 2018, she was awarded the Legend and Leadership Award for Higher Education from the Yale Executive Leadership Institute. The American Alliance of Museums in 2017 awarded her with a Distinguished Service to Museums. In 2013, she received the highest citation of the International Civil Rights Center and Museums, the Austin Jones International Civil and Human Rights Award. She's also an honorary member in Phi Beta Kappa and has served as the Phi Beta Kappa Senator. She received a Candace Award from the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. She is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, and she is the author of numerous books, one of which is uh, of we have at the bookstore and is available for you. Dr. Cole published her edited volume, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility in Museums, along with Laura Lott in 2019, and that is the book that we have available for you. Finally, Dr. Cole is married to James D. Stanton, Jr., and has three sons, one stepson, and three grandchildren. Thank you, Janetta B. Cole, for not being silent at all, ever. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for all that you continue to do. I had the great fortune of being with you a few weeks ago, and I have to say, your leadership, your tremendous gift to higher education, to museums, to us, all of us, can never be understated. Thank you for accepting the invitation to come to NYU and to join us.
please join us on the stage to accept this award. My sisters, my brothers, and in the spirit of true inclusivity, I address you as my siblings all. Good evening. There's an African proverb that says, it does no harm to be grateful. And so I want to turn to you, President Hamilton. And after listening to you, I think your new title is Brother President. <laughs> I certainly want to turn to my ever so special sister friend, Vice President Lisa Coleman. And I turn to all of the colleagues that I've been meeting over the last period of time, colleagues in New York University's Office of Global Inclusion. And to all of you, I am saying this, not from the top, not from the middle, but from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you for this award. In addition to the great honor of receiving NYU's Trailblazer Award, I want you to know it's just a joy. Where I grew up in the South, we'd say it's a pure D joy <laughs> to be back at NYU, to connect with folk that I care deeply about. Well, we know it. We are being told it repeatedly. This is the year when we acknowledge the official adoption of the 19th Amendment that took place 100 years ago. There's an inevitable question. You know, this is where the professor in me comes out to ask the obvious question, and that is, so what progress have we made in terms of gender equality over the past century? Of course we made progress. When we look back 100 years ago in this country, my country, individuals who identified as women whether they were cis or women in other diverse realities, had very, very few social freedoms. They had restricted legal rights and very limited job opportunities. There have been impressive gains, and yet, the struggle for gender equality and inclusion is a mighty, 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 mighty long way from over. The leaders in higher education, nonprofit organizations, businesses, government are still overwhelmingly straight, white, men. And a hundred years later, 
we are still making references to women as if we are some homogeneous group. As if you've seen one of us, you've seen of us all. When the challenges faced by women of color, lesbians, transgender, and non-binary people are so severe, when the challenges faced by women who live in a country that claims its Christianity as essential, and yet these women are of different faiths. The plight of the otherly abled, and when we add women, is perpetually ignored. If we really want to take stock of how far we have come, then I invite us to own the ongoing violence against women. As many as 85% of women experience sexual harassment in the workforce. One in five women will be raped in their lifetime. One in four will experience domestic violence. And I have used women as if when you've seen one of us, you've seen us all. When we know that the percentages are greater, are so great for women of color, and even greater for lesbians, transgender, and non-binary people. So the inevitable question, what are we supposed to do now? A hundred years have passed since the, past, since the true ratification of the 19th Amendment giving women to vote. Some women, a movement led by suffragettes who often insisted that women of color should march separately from them. Well, I think for our nation to flourish, for us to continue to make progress in ending all forms of inequality, including gender inequality, we got some work to do. First, we've obviously got to ensure that federal, state, and local agencies responsible for implementing and protecting laws said to protect all citizens, that those laws are indeed enforced. And in the absence of laws that do not protect us all, we gotta simply get us some new laws, and then we gotta enforce them. Clearly, if we are ever to move more rapidly toward a perfect union, we've got to radically transform our educational systems. Systems that too often teach and perpetuate inequality. Thirdly, it seems to me there is some action that must be done by people like you and me. Work that allows us to own and then to deal with our biases, our bigotries, and our individual practices of racism, classism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, all forms of 
isms. Now, this is far easier said than done. And ever so briefly, I want to share how well I know that the work I'm suggesting that we all must do, this is tough work. I grew up in the South in those wretched days of legalized segregation known as Jim Crow. And I grew up feeling the bitter stings of discrimination based on the color of my skin and my gender. But in spite of the omnipresent racism and sexism that I encountered, I had parents, I had kin folks, I had a Girl Scout leader, I had teachers, I had preachers who helped me to push against the dominant narrative that said no matter what I did, I could never be as good as a white person or a man. Learning to push against that led me into organized struggles for civil and women's rights. Now, as you know from Sister V.P. Lisa's introduction, I did academic work in the field of anthropology, but that discipline, as broad as it was, was never broad enough for me. I couldn't find myself often enough. And so I began to work in African American studies. Then I began to work in women's studies. Here's the story that I'm working up on. So in 1984, when in response to an invitation from one of my mentors, Donna Shalala, I joined the faculty at Hunter College. Now, I honestly believed that when I arrived at Hunter College, I had been a professor of anthropology, of women's studies and African-American studies. I didn't know the word, but looking back, if I had known the word, I would have said, on questions of inequality, I was woke. <laughs> and then I met Audrey Lord. Audrey Lord loved to describe herself. In fact, as she became the port laureate of the state of New York, she would not allow anyone else to introduce her because she wanted to stand and say, I am Audrey Lord, a black woman, lesbian, mother, professor, poet, and warrior. And don't you even dare try to deny me any of my multiple identities. I don't get up at 8 o'clock in the morning and from 8 to 9 I decide to be black. <laughs> Only at 9 to turn into a woman. But I got to hurry because by 10 I'm a lesbian. It was Audre Lorde who helped me to understand that this is a non-ending journey. And no matter your multiple identities or mine, there is still so much for us to learn about ourselves and about all others. And so tonight, as I gratefully and very humbly accept this Trailblazers Award, I feel the necessity to make 
at least two commitments. First, although I am in the third act of my life, and I really do hope the curtain is not going to come down anytime soon, I commit to continuing to learn about all expressions of human diversity. And in accepting this award, I also commit to remaining in the struggle for gender and all other forms of equality, a struggle that requires education, legislation, and where necessary, agitation. <laughs> Onward. Onward. Lisa and we. You're going to sit on the far side. Are we on? Yes, thank you. So now we're going to have a little brief conversation. I'm going to ask Dr. Cole a few questions, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So my first question is, your career has been one that movies and books are made of, groundbreaking, awe-inspiring, and we've heard a little bit about your background. And so I am wondering a little bit, as you were going through your educational, thank you, your educational processes and the various points along your stellar career, did you know you wanted to be a president? Can you tell us a little bit more about your journey to the presidencies of Spelman, Bennett, and now the National Council of Negro Women? And tell us a little bit about what you're most proud of along that journey. Well, when I was growing up, I had my set speech. You know how grown folk just not terribly creative often in the presence of children. And so the question, and little girl, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I had my answer. I was going to be a baby doctor. <laughs> you know, I think an indication of where notions of gender equality were. I wasn't imagining being a neurosurgeon. I was going to be a baby doctor. And I stuck to it. I stuck to it through my year at Fisk, transferring to Oberlin, until one day. And this is a tribute to the power of a good teacher. If you want to be fancy, call yourselves professors. <laughs> Where's my OB sister? So back in the day before you were a student at Oberlin, I am in what we would call the dorms. And I say to my, my girls, I need a class. And it can't, re it can't meet before 8. <laughs> in fact, how about not before 10? The teacher can't be a bore, the professor, and I wanted to help, you know, my social science requirement. Somebody said, take this. I hear he's so-so, it'll be okay. I had to spell out the last word. I could read, introduction to cultural, and throw apology. <laughs> what was that? But I'm game, so I walk in. <laughs> Usual expectation, prof will come in, prof will go to the board, she'll write her name up and welcome the class. Uh-uh. 
George Eaton Simpson, this tall, lanky, white man, walked in, went straight to a record player, put on, that tells you how old I am, record player, <laughs> puts it on the record, and then he starts moving around the classroom. And we're just sitting there, and he's going, and I'm saying, what am I doing? <laughs> and just as he started, he went back to the record player, took the needle off, and said, good morning, class. My name is George Eaton Simpson. This is Introduction to Cultural Anthropology, and I have just demonstrated, simulated, what happens in a Jamaican revivalist cult where people are inviting the Orishas, the spirits, to possess them. And then he said, looking straight at me, in the New World, in a black church, sometimes it's called getting happy. I said, goodbye, pediatrics. <laughs> Hello, anthropology. <laughs> so. Well, there it is. OK. <laughs> Thank you. So recently, as I mentioned earlier, I had the great fortune to spend some time with you and some other extraordinary thought leaders. And at that time, you mentioned, um, and so for those of you who don't know, as I mentioned, post-retirement, there have been lots of, lots of things that Dr. Cole has done. And one of the things that she's done most recently is to become the head of the National Council of Negro Women. And um, so for those of you not familiar with the National Council of Negro Women, it's a nonprofit founded in 1935 by Mary uh, McLeod Bethune. And the mission is to advance the opportunities and quality of life for African-American women, their families, communities, and to encourage the participation of black women in civic, political, and economic and educational activities. And there are 28 affiliate organizations on more than 200 based community sections. And NCNW has an outreach to nearly 4 million women. So before I get to my real question, I have another question. What is it like to sit in the chairs in the office of Mary McLeod Bethune and Dorothy Height? That's just a fangirl question. I just have to know. It is. It is an experience that takes me, at least metaphorically, to my knees. When I arrive in DC at least once a month, and I go to the national headquarters of the National Council of Negro Women, I arrive at 633 Pennsylvania Avenue, Northwest. It is the only building between the White House and the Capitol, owned by black people, owned by black women. Before she went to glory, NYU alumna, Dr. Dorothy Irene Height, burned the market. But when I head into that building, I do not fail to remember that just away away from that building was a place, a horrible place, where enslaved people were bought and sold. And so I'm trying to help you understand what it's like to walk into that building and then to sit in a chair of Dorothy Irene Height. Some of you may not know that Dr. Height was accepted to Barnard. 
And she packed up and went. And she was told, so sorry, Barnard has reached its quota for your kind. And not to be dissuaded, she just got her bad self together, came over here to NYU. And we're so glad she did. She is often referred to as number seven. There were six great civil rights leaders, all men. John Lewis, Martin Luther King, Jim Forbes, A. Philip Randolph, you know them. And then there was Dorothy Irene Height. She was always there, but because of patriarchy, rarely acknowledged. Her mentor was the legendary Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. And when in this acknowledgement of 100 years of struggle, we need to remember the roles of black women of women of different realities. Because we call them the names of these white folk who are women. But what about the fact that Mary McLeod Bethune, who founded Bethune-Cookman College, now Bethune-Cookman University, who founded the National Council of Negro Women in 1935, who was a co-founder of the United Negro College Fund, she got on a bicycle and would run around knocking on doors to raise money to pay the poll taxes because Southern white lawmakers had invented the poll tax to keep black folk from voting. She taught folk to read and write. The president of the college would gather folk to teach them to read and write so that they could go and vote. So I gotta say to you, Sister Lisa, when especially black folk tell me they ain't gonna vote, I say, I got something for you. <laughs> I'm gonna call down the spirit of Mary McLeod Bethune <laughs> and Fannie Lou Hamer to haunt you. <laughs> so it's, it's an extraordinary privilege and joy to work in this organization that, you know, during these times, these very difficult times politically in our country, is a place where I can take my concerns and my outrage. And I can ask the question, if I'm so outraged, then what can I and nearly four million women of African descent do? And you know what the answer is right now. I mean, we've got our standard programs, but we are focused. I mean, we are obsessed about the census and about voting. Because all the things that we, as women, in the fullness of our diversity care about, we can do something about when we are better counted and when we vote. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Today is Super Tuesday, as you know, and so when so many are exercising their right to vote. And so I was very happy to hear about the focus, um, particularly on the census and voting. So switching gears a little bit slightly, here at NYU, uh, as, as, we, as you've heard, we're honoring women, including those who've been excluded and marginalized, and our tagline is revisiting our past, innovating for our future. So now I'd like to move to talk about the present and talk a little bit about the current state of black women. And I also wanted to mention that, um, and thank you for being one of the architects for the Faculty Resource Network and the partnership 
with Spelman and other HBCUs and HSIs. Uh, for those of you who don't know this, um, Dr. Cole was one of the architects for our, here at NYU, Faculty Resource Network that is now running out of the office of the provost where we partner with numerous uh, historically black colleges and universities as well as Hispanic serving institutions. And so thank you for that. Um, and so as we, uh, as we talk about sort of the current state of black women and in particular draw upon the work of people like Kimberly Crenshaw and her concept of intersectionality, um, and I'm going to just assume that people know what intersectionality is, but if you don't, we'll, we'll come back to that. But given all the shifts that we've seen, for you, could you for, for a few moments just reflect on how we move from singularity to plurality, right, to thinking about some of the things that you mentioned earlier, instead of looking at women through a single lens as if one woman represents all women, and how do we really um, develop practices to broaden these definitions of women and to deal with the current differentials that have real immediate effects on people across those differences? If I really had a good response to that, I shouldn't be sitting here. I should be way out there really promoting a response to what you've asked. But this I do feel very strongly, that there is a role for inner work. I mean inner work. I mean working on yourself. <laughs> Figuring out who you are. And owning your own multiple identities. There's a reason I took time to tell that story about how Audre Lorde taught me so powerfully. Because I really believe that my own, if I can put it in pips, progress on the journey towards social justice took a big leap when I understood my own multiple identities. That simultaneously, I am a victim of systems of inequality. And I have the ability to victimize others. I live in a country where I grew up as a Christian, and I still so identify. But I can be an individual of privilege towards folk who are of Jewish faith, Islamic faith, Hindu faith, Buddhist faith. You mentioned my great-grandfather. I didn't grow up poor. And so on the basis of class, I can be in a privileged, and indeed I am in a privileged position. As a cis woman, I am in an extraordinary privileged position. And so what I'm saying is I think, as, as hokey as it sounds, if we begin with our own inner work, of owning our own stuff and acknowledging our own multiple identities, then I think we're in a position to maybe work with some folk who got a whole lot more privilege than we do. But I was quite serious when I said in my very brief remarks, I really think there's no real magic here. It is about education, both self-education and the education in the system sense. And it is about laws. And like Dr. King said, when necessary, always nonviolently, it is about organizing. It is about agitation. 
So as we end the, uh, near the end of our conversation, um, let's go back to where we began. And um, we've talked a little bit about different, um, different, uh, different types of women, et cetera. And one of the things that I hear a lot is uh, people like to criticize the newer generations, uh, millennials and Generation Z. But I know that you have often spoken about your hope for and with these new generations. Can you talk a little bit about what inspires you the most when you think about new generations, our collective futures, new areas of innovation, where we might go from here? Well, first I just got to thank you for sharing those words of your mama. <laughs> because your mom and I share a generation. <laughs> when I, when I had the I guess, outrageous notion that I could serve as the chair of the board, the seventh president of the National Council of Negro Women. I had to like run, you know, you don't just get up and get it, you gotta run for it. <laughs> and so I ran, unopposed, sort of praying, hoping, you know, all fingers, toes crossed, somebody's gonna come forward, I'm not gonna have to do this, Nobody came forward. So I had to come up with, I guess what you call a platform. And I spoke of two things that I thought NCNW simply had to do. If we were gonna be in any way true to the legacy of Dr. Bethune and of Dr. Hyde, the first, I said, is wherever social justice is the agenda at the table, we better find a seat. NCNW belongs there. And many of us remember Shirley Chisholm said, if there's no seat for you at the table, go find a folding chair. And then I said, the second thing I really feel this almost 85-year-old organization must do is it's got to become more intergenerational. You can't have an organization of women only like myself. And so I got to crow a little to say it is really very special to see how these women that I affectionately and respectfully call young'uns <laughs> are moving into leadership roles in NCNW. And I'm just gonna bring closure on that by saying I think every organization, I think every people, every nation, our world, needs roots and wings. And from my generation and those a little bit younger than I, you got to give it to us. We got some roots. But oh, we're not going to make it without the outrageousness of the young ones who have these wings, who, honest to goodness, believe that they can fly. Thank you. And now we'll open it up to the audience. And if there are any questions, we will take them. Hi, Dr. Cole, it's Aziza Taylor. I'm actually one of your youngins. I'm a member of the National Council of Negro Women Manhattan Chapter. <laughs> so I first just wanted to say thank you so much for you know the path that you've paved. It's really been an inspiration in my life from 
researching at Moreland Springer, the Black Suffragettes Movement, to traveling to South Africa to find ways to close the gaps of youth uh, unemployment with young people there, and traveling to Haiti to work on documentary filmmaking with young leaders to teach them ways to tell their stories and to create uh, platforms for social justice and social change. So thank you for all of that. Um, and thank you, Dr. Cohen, for all that you do, and President Hamilton and everybody um, here, because I'm also a graduate of uh, NYU. I graduated with my master's last year in global affairs. So, you know, I'm coming back full circle. <laughs> but all of that to say, I've just really um, understood the importance of not only knowing the multiple identities and stepping into that, no matter what spaces you find yourself in, but just also knowing your story and not being afraid to share that uh, with different generations. So I just wanted to know if you could speak to the importance of knowing your story and how you've been able to translate that to, into various circles um, of impact in your life. I'm thinking of another African saying, until the lion and I always add, and the lioness, <laughs> tell their story. The hunt as a story will always glorify the hunter. Mm. I am really grateful for you raising what you did because when I talked about my view that at Education has a major role in social justice work. I think the telling of our stories, our multiple stories, is a way to really address social justice issues. It is not as dramatic as being a part of a Black Lives Matter march, it perhaps does not have the same impact as making sure that an anti-lynching law was passed. And it might even seem not to have the real significance of learning new pronouns and letting them fall off of our tongues with greater ease. But telling our stories is so important because I think it does two things simultaneously. It honors the uniqueness of our individual stories and it calls forth the connection among our stories. So let's keep telling our stories. Over here? In the back? Yes. Oh. Go ahead. OK. Um, good evening, um, Dr. Cole. My name is Jadea Spencer Mohammed from the faraway land of Brooklyn, New York. Um, <laughs> I came here from uh, like pretty far, like just like uptown. Um, I've been wanting to just. Um, Oh my goodness, this moment is emotional for me because I wanted to literally just say hi to you for like years since I found out that you existed. Um, <laughs> I too, in, uh, an NYU alumna, um, I started here, uh, my God, uh, I graduated in 2015, but I started here when I was, I, I had graduated from high school here in New York City when I was like 15, um, and I came here to NYU to study anthropology. Um, <laughs> and I also, one of my life's dreams is to create like an institution, like a museum of sorts um, that, you know, like the Library of Alexandria, where all the brilliant people in the world can like come together and work on the world's problems and then go abroad. Um, and so now I've become the executive director of a nonprofit that takes black youth and teaches leadership to travel abroad. So it's like, anyway, then I found out that you existed, like you're like a person who's done like all of these like amazing things. And I was like, oh my actual God. This is like <laughs> such, such an honor to even get to say hi. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, because now I have the blessing of representing um, youth who are like, you know, younger than me, I'm 24 now, hi folks. Um, I, I want to like be able to take 
um, some of your experience and some of your energy and all the amazing work that you've done for the culture. Ooh, not gonna cry. All right, I'm back. Um, I wanna just ask you, what would you say have been like the qualities that um, you've been like refining in yourself? Um, like at, up to this point, like I wanna know like what's driving you um, at this you know, very moment and what are the qualities that have gotten you this far? Um, yeah, and, and also if you're taking on any more mentees, cause hi. <laughs> well, I am reaching out and closing my arms and giving you a hug. I, I'm pretty sure I heard you asking what I think are some of the qualities that have gotten me through this very long life. And I think, and this sounds so self-serving and really doesn't sound like me, but I'm gonna say it because I believe it. One of my closest, closest friends, sister friends, was and always will be Dr. Maya Angelou. I was incredibly fortunate to know her well. And Dr. Maya once said, courage is the most important of all the attributes because without it, you cannot honor any of the others. And I just think I have been very fortunate to be courageous. And what that has meant is everything from, you know, arriving at Spelman College as the first African American woman president and discovering that there were students who were literally being isolated on that campus. And in the first months of my presidency, having the courage to get on that platform and as the president of that college saying, there will be a recognized organization for lesbian and bisexual students. I thought those alumni were going to fire me that <laughs> night. But without that courage, you know, I think about where would those students have been? And I had this amazing joy several months ago of being with the sister who became the first president of Aphrodite, as they named that organization. So I really think, you know, courage, we make, it, we make it so big and so unobtainable, and often what only men do. But courage means speaking your truth. It means owning what you think is right. And then I would just say the only other thing that I think has gotten me this far is the, and this is really the truth, and that is I don't take myself too seriously. I take my work seriously, but I don't take myself too seriously. Thank you for that question. I don't think I've ever said all that before. Yes, I see you back there. So we have time for maybe one and a half more questions. <laughs> back there. Uh, good evening, Dr. Cole and good Dr. Uh, Jackson. I'm sorry, did I, is that? Oh, Coleman, oh, I'm so sorry oh, about that. Um, it's an honor to be here. I wanna thank NYU for doing this. Um, it's just an honor to be in your presence. And I think you might have actually answered my question in uh, the last response here, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, and um, that is, 
how can we move towards a more united and compassionate front in the wave of more diversity that we're seeing in our world? Earlier I heard the word um, polarity, and that continues to happen across so many different intersections. So I know courage is a part of that, but I wanted to know if you could just expound on how we can continue to move towards that common goal of humanity while still respecting the diversity that exists among, amongst all of us. And again, it's an honor to be in your presence. It's a very beautiful question. Because if we don't keep asking your question, then we really can stay too long in the space that we're calling for now. And that is totally respecting our differences. When where you're asking us to go is another place. I, I'm going to tell a story, and I'm looking at that clock, so I've got to make it super short. And we probably won't get that half a question. The Wintergren Foundation had organized a group of anthropologists, um, not organized, had supported a group of anthropologists to go to Granada in Spain and to have a conference around women's agency. It was fabulous, one of the best anthropological conferences I've ever been to. And at the end, the organizers said at this great final dinner and the red wine was flowing and the food was just off the chain and they said every woman should just stand up and make a toast. Now we were from all over the world and so I remember the first sister who made her toast was from South Africa, Osa in fact, and she said things beautifully. And then somebody from Germany spoke. And somebody from Brazil, you know, using her own Portuguese rhythm. And people were just, it was incredible. And I'm just sitting there and I'm just, I'm just so moved by it all. And then somebody stood up and spoke in English. And I thought, uh-oh. Because at that point, no one had repeated a language. So I thought, hmm, what am I going to say? <laughs> and I was the last to make a toast. So here's my response, my sister, to your question. I stood up. I raised my glass. And I decided I would use the language that my people would use. I said, so y'all listen here. <laughs> Us women folk in here, we bees for difference. We bees for respecting difference? OK, respecting. Respecting difference? Acknowledging difference, promoting difference, till difference don't make no more difference. <laughs> so the answer that I'm really suggesting is we can't get there where difference don't make no more difference until we do a better job of acknowledging and respecting all differences. We're out of time. We're out of time. Any final words for us? You wanna, any final words for us? Thank you so much, Dr. Cole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cole, for being with us tonight. Thank you for accepting the award. Thank you to our audience for being here. And let's just give Dr. Cole one more round of applause.